Hi everyone. We're here today and we're gonna be joined by Lex. Give me one second. They're coming on right now. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, very nice meeting you. Lovely to meet you. Happy to have been engaging uh, via messenger until now. <laughs> I think my AC is going to be too loud. Oh, you got the good the good breeze. That's important. <laughs> I'm I'm on a screened in porch without a fan or anything, so you're going to start to see the the oh. sweat rolling and the oil developing, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Dewey look is in. <laughs> but I'm, I'm safe fan right here, so Yes, that's that's the way to go. I, I always fall asleep with the fan just like directly on as much of my body as physically possible. Okay. All right. <laughs> you need it, right? Where are you again? So I'm located in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Oh, I have a cousin that lives there. Yes. Have... Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm in I'm in West Philly. Where's your cousin located? Um not sure. I know she's in there. Philly's she, pretty small compared to big cities, so. You said that she's like 30 minutes, I, I think maybe two hours away from Atlantic City. Oh, cool. So that's, yeah, everything is so close to Atlantic City, to New York City. So we, we may have crossed paths, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, well, so I just want to be transparent, you know, in this conversation regarding, you know, whatever we're talking about, I just want to be respectful and I want to be an ally. Like when it comes to non-binary, I don't know much about the non-binary community. So if any moment that I'm crossing my boundaries or anything, please let me know. Absolutely. Yeah. I will respectfully let you know how I am feeling. <laughs> oh, please. I appreciate that. Um, and also, why don't you introduce yourself to whoever's yeah. watching? Yeah you know pronouns you're using and all of that yes that sounds perfect also i'm just gonna like rearrange my phone because it keeps slipping and then you get like a chin and no neck which is a little <laughs> bit odd so we're gonna work on that okay uh, here we go we're right. working on it all right so thank you so much for the introduction uh my name is mix lex horowitz i am 23 years old and i identify as a queer non-binary lgbtq plus educator, activist, model, and mental health advocate based in West Philly. Um, some other important parts of my identity are that I am Jewish, I am white, I am, my family is upper class, I myself am middle upper class, <laughs> unemployed, like freelance working for myself right now, yeah. but like obviously like the generational kind of like wealth that is just like given to folks is also like a very important part of like identity and understanding like how we have the resources that we do. Uh, second generation college graduate. Um, yeah, those are just some of the, and I forget if I said I use they, them pronouns. Um, that's just what feels the most at home for me. Uh, and the, and for me, my identity sex wise, I don't really identify with a sex. Like I, it isn't something that is connecting for me. Uh, but I did recently have, both my name and my sex marker legally changed. Uh, mm -hmm. So my sex is legally recognized as non-binary. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I really didn't know that that was even a thing. So Yeah. And it's only available in certain states. Um, mm -hmm. I believe there's 12 states right now. And I also don't even think that Pennsylvania is openly kind of showing that non-binary mm -hmm. is an option. But I had heard from a handful of non-binary folks who lived in Pennsylvania who said that they, I think there were two people that were able to get non-binary, even though like the media and the state isn't saying that it's an option currently, or maybe I just am like behind in the news because of the millions of things that are happening right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm extremely grateful. I found out in May that my name and my sex marker were officially accepted as <laughs> like my legal recognition, which is a beautiful feeling. And any questions that like you have or anyone watching has about like what it means for me to be non-binary, to be Jewish, 
to be a white person in the United States, which is a society that is built on anti-blackness and white supremacy, like whatever questions or areas or things that people want to talk about, I am, I am game for it. Okay, cool. That's actually is my next question because on your profile, you listed as a non-binary trans mask Jew. I understand one third of the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, good. like, I think it's very important to acknowledge. It's crazy that it's 2020 and we still haven't acknowledged, you know, non-binary people in all like 50 states. So yeah. why don't you tell us what it means to be non-binary and trans? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit muddy about that. So. Oh, of course. So yeah. what I can do is I, I can give you the definitions that I understand to be the, the broadest, most uh, generalized definitions. And then I can share what it looks like for my life specifically. Because as a non-binary person who has a platform, I am, I am can only speak for myself. Uh, yeah. But there's a lot of folks who um, get into or by mistake like speak on behalf of an entire group or community or sentiment, whatever that is. And so I just want to like note that everything that I'm sharing as an educator is for educational purposes with yeah. my own lived experiences. Um, and so for me, so for folks who are unfamiliar with uh, just transgender, trans being someone who is assigned uh, a specific sex or gender at birth, and they discover internally that they do not identify with that gender and or sex. Could be both, could be mm -hmm. like one or the other. So for me, I use both non-binary and trans masculine in order to encompass how I understand my gender to be not within the binary of man and woman. So mm -hmm. I live outside of that, what I perceive to be a restrictive, um, restrictive boxes of gender. So that's where the non-binary comes from is that many times uh, the media represents transgender people as to be trans, you are going from one end of the spectrum to yeah. the other. You're going from whether it's sex, identifying as uh, being assigned male at birth to, uh, to being female or being assigned female at birth to identifying as male. And then when we look at gender, right, someone who is told they have to be a woman and they know that they are a man or someone who's told that they have to be a man and they know that they're a woman, which mm -hmm. is the lived experience of many trans people, right? There are many binary trans folks. Yeah. However, there are also non-binary trans folks who similarly to trans folks who live within the binary, mm -hmm. non-binary folks are told that they have to be a specific gender and or sex and they do not identify with that. But that doesn't mean that they identify as the opposite or the co-aligning aspect of gender or sex that our society has tried to make seem this clean dichotomy that is somehow uh, relating both sex and gender, which is a myth. And mm -hmm. so for me, it's important to note that I am not a binary trans person. And so for me to show that I'm not I'm not a trans man, even though I do present very masculinely in my appearance, right? So as someone who was assigned female at birth, I was extremely uncomfortable with my chest once I came to my trans identity. So I have had top surgery. I'm mm -hmm. taking testosterone. So I have done, I have done uh, social transitioning with cutting my hair and wearing clothes that make me feel affirmed and using my name and my pronouns on top of right medical transitioning to feel fully myself and my body. And then also I have like broached into the legal transitioning, right? Wanting to be legally recognized as a non-binary trans person. Yeah. And so within all of that, non-binary for me just means like, I am not a man, I am not a woman, my gender identity is too expansive to be restricted by what society likes to neatly define as a man or a woman. And then for trans masculine, sorry, I'm just like going on a very long rant. <laughs> and so for tra it's yeah. helpful. Is it helpful? Yeah, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can hear myself talk so much. Uh. <laughs> much. <laughs> Yay! Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. Um, and so for trans masculine, also just like as like a little note is that these are not the terms that I started my my gender identity and exploration, understanding myself to be. I didn't have those words when I first realized that I was queer. I came to my my queer identity first through sexuality in college. Mm. I went into college. I thought that I was a cis straight woman. Uh, very quickly found out that was not the case. I fell madly in love with a woman uh, who was actually on my sports team because uh, I've been an athlete my whole life. And so my first kind of 
taking all of the repressed messages and feelings and identities from within was when I fell madly in love with someone who at the time was the same gender as myself or who folks believed to be the same gender. So I came out as gay, felt so much happier with myself, but then realized that uh, saying that I'm a gay woman still doesn't feel right. Okay, so let's explore. Maybe I just need to present more masculinely. Felt so much better. I was like, yes, I'm masculine, but it still doesn't feel right because saying that I'm a gay masculine woman still just like doesn't hit right. It kind of hurts, it feels uncomfortable. So it was more than just expression, right? I wasn't a masculine presenting woman. I was a, not gay, but a queer, gender, gender fluid, gender queer, non-binary, whichever term, person who knew myself to be masculine. And so when I realized that it was more than just expressing myself, right? I wasn't comfortable with being called a woman. I had to actually start to figure out gender identity for myself and what felt most at home. The, the, the language that I had was like trans man, right? Was, I, I'm not a trans woman because I was assigned female at birth. If I wanted to be a woman, I would be a cis woman. Um, <laughs> and so like the words that I had were very binary, but I heard of gender queer. And I was like, that is very vague. It is pretty much like what does gender queer even mean except for the fact that you have a non-normative or queered gender I was like I love how non-descriptive it is and allows me space to figure out like how I really feel and who I really am yeah. and so in college after I came out as gay and then used queer seeing queer as more expansive than gay which has traditionally been used as like a man who loves a man or a woman who likes a woman I'm like well, if I'm not in the binary, how can I use binary terms such as gay or bisexual? Like, that's my own personal opinion. So I decided to use queer for sexuality and genderqueer for my, my queered understanding of my gender, my non-normative gender identity. I messed around with trying to figure out the language, what felt like it was home. I heard the term demi-boy, which I felt like I related to, but I didn't really... When I said it for myself, it just didn't feel right because any type of identify. Oh, do you yes. What is demi boy? Yes, demi boy or demi girl mm. means partially to fully identifying with being a boy or man or a girl slash woman. So I have a question. I have friends who are non-binary and they use pronouns they them and sometimes depends he or she. Yeah. But the close circle. Would that be considered demi-boy or demi-girl? So I, I typically say that unless the person openly uses those terms or those labels, mm -hmm. like it isn't, like I wouldn't feel comfortable like saying like, yes, that is what their identity is because although yeah. someone's identity may like on paper line up with the definitions that we've been given, that doesn't mean that they necessarily like hold that as a part of their identity. Yeah. Um, so I'm unsure if that person identifies as a demi boy or a demi girl, maybe both. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, uh, like I just know personally, folks that I know who identify as whether non-binary or trans who are not within the trans binary and use multiple pronouns. Sometimes those are folks who identify as agender. So just not really feeling a connection with any gender, whether that's being a woman or non-binary or a man. A lot of times it can be because they know themselves to be pangender or bigender, which is having more than one gender identity or understanding. Um, so pretty much the pronouns that we use can very commonly give us hints or clues ha as to what the person's gender identity is and how we can be the most respectful. But unless we know the actual terms that that person uses uh, and like what their identity terms that they understand themselves to be, just mm -hmm. having pronouns won't actually tell us like, is this person to identify as non-binary or gender queer or a demigirl? unless they like use those terms and we know that they use those terms, it's kind of an unknown. Oh, okay. Um, so what I like about you, like following you, is that just because you identify at a certain group, but you're very free when it comes to gender expression. And a lot of people who don't know it, I like learned about that a couple of years ago. Just because someone identifies a certain way, doesn't mean that they have to dress to fit that category. So can you tell people who don't know what is gender expression is? Yes, of course. And so you like, we, yes, I am so ready. I love having these conversations so much because it, 
it's wild that there are three definitions about oh. gender identity mm-hmm. that, uh, that our society has historically conflated that make us think that gender is the same thing as sex and expression is the same thing as gender. Mm-hmm. And although those things may be true for many people, that is not necessarily what it is for a, a significant portion of the population, even if it is a smaller percentage than the majority. And so when I say the three definitions, I'm talking about the difference between gender identity, gender expression, and sex assigned at birth. And so whether we're looking at the medical industry or uh, legal, like legal things in court or social aspects of society, our language that we use to describe gender identity, to describe gender expression and sex assigned at birth have been incorrectly conflated and intermixing uses of those terms that make it extremely difficult for trans folks to even have the language to know that expression is different than their actual internal identity or what their sex is. And so long rant, now to the definitions. <laughs> uh, no, it's neat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I studied psychology and gender sexuality and women's studies in undergrad. Uh, so it is a huge passion of mine. So not only... What was yeah. that, sorry? And that's something that people don't understand, too. Just because we're LGBT in the big umbrella doesn't mean that, like, we know fully about the others. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like, a lot of people, when they think of LGBTQ, mostly they, they see or have associated with gay, lesbian, now just kind of into the trans category. But it's very important to know that, like, there's another group, which is queer community is like, you know, non-binary. And now I'm learning about Demi Boy and Demi Girl. And it's, it's so good to know about it, you know? Because yeah. like, we have to proactively want to do better. So it's good to learn about the other groups. Yeah. Yes. So go ahead, yes. Yes, uh, retweet that all, yes. <laughs> oh, I love a little bit of education during the day. We love it. I'm oh learning. <laughs> yes, thank you, that makes me so happy. Um, and so also remind me to define, <laughs> remind me to define trans masculine after I give these three definitions, because it's yes. like a perfect segue. Yes. And so when we talk about gender identity, we are talking, that means someone's internal sense of self as being a woman, non-binary, a man, a gender, pangender, you name it. Those are the terms that we use for gender identity. And because gender identity is an internal sense of self, it lies within someone's, whether you want to say their brain, their heart, or their soul. It is completely internal. It is not something that any outsider would know unless that individual themselves has shared what their identity is. So because someone's gender identity is within their head, you only know someone's gender identity if you know that person and they've shared that information with you. What commonly happens is that rather than understanding that when we look at someone, it's their gender expression, so their gender expression or gender presentation, which is how they are choosing to express themselves or show themselves to the external world at any given time. And the words that we use to describe expression are masculine, feminine, and androgynous. So those are the terms we use for expression, right? So my, my expression right now, right, if you just saw like my head up, right, I have a short haircut. I have facial hair, which is barely noticeable. <laughs> I have like these things. <laughs> I have like these things that our society has designated in the category of masculine. Yes. Masculine is a presentation and expression. It is external. In a sense, if you know of Kate Bornstein or any very, very big, just queer writers, right? We talk about gender as, or even like Judith Butler, right? Like gender as performative. So if you think of gender as something that is performative, then the thing that you see is someone's gender expression. It's their gender presentation of them presenting or appearing to be masculine, feminine, and or androgynous. Mm. What you do not know when you look at someone is their gender identity, whether they are a woman, a man, gender expansive, gender queer, et cetera. Mm. And so what commonly happens is that I will see a stranger walking down the street and I will make a quick, um, I will make a quick assumption, whether subconsciously or consciously, about what that person's sex is, what their gender is, and what their expression is. Mm. And because most of the time this happens unconsciously, I will conflate my understanding of expression, right? That external thing that is how they are choosing to show themselves as masculine, feminine, and or androgynous, literally only in that moment, right? Because that same person who's wearing a suit 
could go inside in the restroom and put on a sparkly pink dress and a wig. And as a completely different presentation as feminine, their gender identity is still the same. Mm. I do not know what that person's gender identity is just by seeing them wearing a suit in the street because then their gender identity is the same whether they're wearing a dress in the street as well. But what we do wrong with our conflation and our assumptions is that when we look at someone, we use gender identity terms instead of expression terms. So if I saw someone presenting masculinely on the street, although that is their gender expression in that during that one moment in that one time that I saw them, commonly mm -hmm. people will say, oh, that man, because we have conflated masculinity, that expression, that external presentation of being masculine, whether it's short hair, suit, tie, et cetera, with men. In the same sense that if we see someone wearing a dress and looking feminine, rather than saying, oh, like that person's presenting femininely and using they, them pronouns, because we actually do not know what their gender expression is, unless we happen to know who they are or they've told us, or they're wearing a shirt that says like, I'm a woman, or like, I'm a man, or like, I'm non-binary, right? Unless we have those, that information, we can't say that that person is a woman. The only thing we can say is that that person is presenting femininely in this one moment, this one day in time. Mm. And so that's how I like to differentiate how we understand gender identity as being this internal sense of self only only I am the one that can tell you what my gender identity is in the same sense if someone told me like, Lex, you're a man. No, Lex, you're a woman. No, like you can't, no one can tell me what my gender identity is. They can say, Lex, you look like you're presenting masculinely today. Mm -hmm. That is my external presentation. You can pull that information in, but guess what? I can, I have my nails painted. My energy is so much like so femme, like there are just so many different aspects of identity that are extremely different and are their own categories. But we have, we have to do the work of taking them apart from each other because that is where a lot of this marginalization and misinformation is coming from. Yeah. Uh, and so then lastly with sex, someone's sex assigned at birth is more than just their external genitalia. When we are born, when we, when we come out of the womb, a physician will look at our external genitalia and say, mm -hmm will conflate gender and sex, this is a great example, will see a penis, and rather than saying your child is male, because penises are associated with male genitalia, the physician will say, your child is a boy. First thing off the bat, you are the physician, the family, society, community, etc., is conflating a person's sex with their gender. This child that is still attached to an umbilical cord and cannot eat, poop, or do anything on their own has no clue what their gender identity is, which means that no one outside of that little child knows what their gender identity is. Because we have to wait until that child tells us what their gender is before we know. We can say what that sex assigned at birth is based on more than just external genitalia. Someone's sex assigned at birth is not, is their chromosomes, it's their hormones, it's their internal and external reproductive organs. It's a combination of sex characteristics that is much more complex than just external genitalia. In the same sense that when I was born, the physician looked at me, said, oh, you have a girl because they looked at my external genitalia, saw that I had a vagina and misconflated sex, female with gender girl. And so it starts that early on, it really does. And so I see that like a lot of my work as an activist, as a model, as an educator is to have these conversations about like, these are three separate things we're talking about. Sex assigned at birth is separate from gender identity, which is separate from gender expression. All of these things come together and create the beautiful array of diverse identities and presentations and genders and sexes that we know. Yeah. But we have to understand that they are not inherently connected to one another. They each have their own very specific kind of role that they play. But the ways in which that they come in contact and create the beautiful identities and expansive identities that we know is important to unpack. Mm. Trans mask. Trans mask, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was told the word trans mask and the moment that it was said, I was like, and that is what I am. <laughs> and so point being is that I needed someone to inform me of the language, the definitions, the communities that existed yeah. 
before I knew that that was what made me me. And so there's also just like this, this facade or like this myth that because like, we have a platform and like, we are confident in ourselves that like, we know everything and like, we've known everything. And like, that is just not true. Like, speaking on behalf of myself, whether this is relevant or not to you, like, I do not know everything. My, my journey, my transition, it is constant. It is something that is going every day. It is not something that like I'm an expert on at all, but I'm able to talk about these things because of doing self work, because of keeping myself educated. And so it was a friend of mine that informed me of the word transmasculine. Mm. And this person told me that, so for me, myself, like I was assigned female at birth and the, the narrative that society plays is that if you are assigned female at birth, we are going to incorrectly link being female to being a girl. We're also going to connect being female and being a girl to being feminine. And because we are going to align these three things, if you are someone who is assigned female at birth, you are societally allowed to, accepted, and supposed to be feminine. So as someone who is assigned female at birth, I'm allowed to be feminine because society says that females are feminine, are women. Okay. So as someone who is assigned female at birth, I do not identify as female or male or any sex, but I'm societally allowed to be feminine. Whereas I know myself, I just have this, I know myself to be masculine. I like whether it's my body in presenting masculinely, the clothes that I wear, I just, I'm a masculine person. And so as someone who's assigned female at birth, I wasn't allowed to be masculine. I was told I had to be feminine. Yes. So this, this change, this shift, this, this understanding of myself internally as being a masculine person and not a feminine person is trans masculine. So as a, as someone who's assigned female at birth, mm -hmm. I can be feminine and trans masculine, but you, I wouldn't, that would not be called, I would not be called trans feminine, trans feminine is the term that is used for folks who are assigned male at birth. And because they are assigned male at birth, they are told by society, hey, you're assigned male, which means you have to be masculine. If these folks who are assigned male at birth are like, I'm, I am not a masculine person, I know myself to be feminine, that shift away from those societal ideals and being told that you have to be masculine is trans feminine. And so a lot of the, I mean, all of the language that we use is socially constructed, period, like literally everything. And so, I un so the understanding of trans masculine and trans feminine is this understanding that I understand it also to be somewhat political in the sense like I was told that I had to be feminine and like fuck you because like I like I understand myself to be masculine and so I am non-binary trans masculine yes. but I also as you can see because I talk with my hands and I do like a whole bunch of stuff like I am a very feminine person like I know that my internal energy is feminine and so I would say that I am a queer, feminine, non-binary, trans-masculine person. Mm -hmm. I would not say that I am a queer, non-binary, trans-feminine person because I am not someone who is assigned male at birth. I am allowed by society's terms to be feminine if I want to be feminine. Yeah, well said. I mean, <laughs> I feel like that's more than I've learned in high school. Just about gender. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, I mean, like, that's sad, but that makes me happy. Like, is, it is the sad truth that, like, we spend so many years in school. We, we, ne we never learned about this. We never learned about racism. It's crazy. Yeah, I'm learning so much about, like, you and, like, many other people with a platform talking about it. So I know that what before we doing this, Kiki, I did a lot of research about non-binary just to be right. I Thank I, you. I cannot say that like I'm not going to make mistake in the future, but I always want to be right about this because I don't want to disrespect anyone. So here are some facts that I found online and I hope you can like kind of like elaborate. Yeah. So it's said right here that being non-binary isn't the same as being intersex. Intersex people have the anatomy or genes that don't fit typical definition of male or female, and most identify as men or women. Um, Non-binary people are usually not intersex. They're born with the bodies that they fit the typical definition of male and female, but their innate gender identity is something other than male and female. 
Mm. That is that correct? I am going to unpack it a little bit. Uh, okay. For the most part, and, you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say what I have to say because I know I'm gonna I'm gonna by accident say something else. Is that okay? <laughs> well, because like the information and the resources about trans people in general is very limited. It's very repetitive. Limited. Yes. And when I did research of non-binary people, it's even less than what is should be available out there. So I know that some of this information, when I read about it, I'm just like, wait, that's a little bit. So I wonder if I can ask someone who's not yeah. definitely unpack it better. So. Yes. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you brought this up. Um, so I'm gonna start by just intersex. So when we talk about sex, right, we're talk the terms that we use for sex are female, male, and intersex. Yes. There are not just three sexes. Let's say it one more time. There are not just three sexes. Mm -hmm. Intersex is an umbrella term, similarly to how trans is an umbrella term for trans women, trans men, non-binary folks, gender queer folks, etc. right? So trans is not just one gender. Trans is the umbrella term for a vast array of genders. In the similar sense, intersex is the umbrella term for the vast array of sex um, of sex characteristics that are a combination of male and female that folks can have that do not that do not cleanly fit into the boxes that folks call male and female. And so intersex is not its own. It's not like there's not one way to be intersex. Intersex is referring to someone who has a combination of sex characteristics that are both male and female. And that can look just so many different ways. And so Understanding that we have always known that there are more than two sexes. Intersex people have existed since people have existed. Not everyone. That's why we have so many problems. I feel like queer people have a better understanding that mm. the universe of gender is complex, but the majority of people out there who just identify with male and female, feminine and masculinity, they don't understand any of Yes, them. it's so. true. Yes, it's, it's very hard to have conversations with folks who are not personally impacted by the conversation because they don't have an internal drive or an innate desire to be educated. So I totally hear that. But, but if people focused on literature and listened to stories and like paid attention to history, they yeah. should know. <laughs> they should know that like whether you want to look at religious texts or you yeah. want to look at like visual representations in art. And we can even look at India. In India, there have always been more than two legally recognized genders. There are, well, in this case, sexes. There are women, there are men, and there are hedra. Hedra are folks who are, without trying to put Western culture on where it should not be, that is how we would understand transness in India. Those are folks who are not just women or not just men. They have I am not doing this definition justice. I need to drink more water. Oh my goodness. Point being is that <laughs> in India, they recognize that there have always been yeah. more than two sexes. There have been more than two genders. Uh, in the same sense, if we look at Native, Native American culture and society, right? You have men, you have women, and you have two spirit people, right? Mm -hmm. There have always been more than just two genders and two sexes. It is a myth. It is a lie. It is such a harmful lie that there is just when we talk about sex, male and female. And when we talk about gender, there's just women and men. Because there is so much evidence and support for the fact that it, there has always been more. And so the fact, it's also important to talk about intersex folks who also there is not, there is not as much research and data and just information on their lived experience because the erasure of intersex people and trying to make intersex people one specific sex when they are children and they are, there are, surgeries performed on them by physicians who it's just it is the most it is one of the most horrific things please if you do not know about intersex folks please look at the intersex project please follow uh river gallo and pigeon uh two intersex activists that are doing fantastic work and there are so many more who are i am not intersex myself so like as a as someone who is an ally for that community i don't want to like speak on behalf of them but it's also important to note that someone who is someone who is intersex in the same way that someone who is cisgender or someone who is non-binary or transgender has the ability to internally come to their gender identity. Someone mm -hmm. who is intersex can be a man 
or a woman or non-binary or gender fluid or agender, pangender, etc. Because intersex is referring to their sex. Their sex as being a combination of male and female characteristics. That person's gender identity is still their gender identity, which is separate from their sex. Mm. So I, as, as, an, as a non-binary person, the intersex folks who I know just so happen to also be non-binary because like I surround myself by folks who like help me like feel seen and heard and understood. Mm. But there are plenty of intersex people who also identify within the binary as women or as men. And so I, the one thing that I was like, oh, I want to unpack this from the, the thing that you found online was that I don't think that there are enough research or statistics to say like the majority of people that are intersex are binary because there are so many non-binary people that exist in the United States and the world at large and there are zero research that include us in the census that include us in medical research that include us in anything so how are we going to use statistics to understand intersex people when the ways in which like research is probably like keeping track of intersex people is probably wrong yeah. Um, and so, like, I just wanted to know, like, intersex is referring to the vast array of sex characteristics that are combinations of male and female, whereas gender, right, is something that is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if I missed anything else. So someone who is intersex can also identify as trans, right, because mm -hmm. that's a gender identity, or they can choose to not identify as trans. It yes. truly is the individual choice right because only they know what their gender identity is and what sex they identify with mm, yeah wow that's a lot of breakdown i mean <laughs> we we did great it just for like 30 minutes okay so i want to go into some questions i have yes when i'm gonna talk with someone who's non-binary i have a lot of questions sent at me so i just want to see if we can go into it a little bit yes. um so one of the question is, what are the standards etiquette for people who have never met or associated themselves with non-binary people? And um, what can they do to make non-binary people experience more comfortable? Incredible question. So what I would say to that is, whether someone is non-binary or trans or cisgender, Pronouns matter. The language we use in conversation with others matters because language gives power. Language can invoke a very intense emotional, mental, and physical experience within people. And so this understanding that, yes, of course, pronouns are important for trans people, but update, it's important for everyone because in order to respect people as humans, we want to respect their identities. Hmm. So what I would say is that whether or not you know that you are sharing a space, whether it's an online space or in person or family, whatever it may be with someone, always, always bring in your name and your pronouns at the very least. That is a tangible thing that yeah. every single person watching this or hearing this or talking about it later can do. Whether you are trans or cis or queer or straight, like I do not care. Like you can be doing these things. So what that looks like is in social media bios, putting your name and your pronouns. If you're comfortable, putting your gender, right? You can say like, I am a cisgender trans ally, or like I am a trans masculine person. At the very least, put your name and your pronouns. Because if you are someone who is straight, let's say that you are straight and trans, putting your pronouns in the bio for someone will help them have a conversation about pronouns. Let's say that you are cisgender and queer, Putting your pronouns in your bio, even though you yourself are not a trans person, will hopefully help to keep the conversation around the importance of pronouns and language as a tool that can either create violence or affirmation. Mm. So the point being is that, like my parents, they are always wearing their pronoun pins. They are oh. always making sure, and they're both physicians. And it's because like they know that there is power in not only affirming someone, but in creating the conversation with people who are not inherently having this desire to have the conversation because it doesn't impact them. Mm. In your email signature, your name, right? Your prefix, my prefix is mix, spelled M-X, but it sounds like mix as in you're mixing a cake. That's instead of using Mr. Mr. or Mrs. etc. 
And so like I always put mix Lex Horowitz underneath pronouns they them. Yeah. Every person can do that. Every person. So it's about bringing yourself into a conversation and knowing that you are going to share your name and your pronouns and you're going to ask other people. Every single conversation, whether it's a DM on Instagram or I meet someone because I'm getting coffee and the barista is super cool. I'm like, oh, I'm Lex. My pronouns are they, them. Like, what's your name and pronouns? Sometimes people are like, say they were wearing a green shirt. He was wearing. You froze, you froze up a little. Oh no, am I still gone? I lost you after the barista. Okay, you, should I exit out and come back in or can you hear me now? I can hear you perfectly now. Oh, yeah. perfect. Okay, so we'll just make this work. So I'm gonna do the example of a barista. Okay. Oh my gosh, and now my, my phone is moving. Okay, there we go. So the example uh -huh. of a barista Yes. is that I walk into a coffee shop and I, I'm vibing with this barista. Uh, I see that their name is on their shirt and their name is Aaron, but I, I see their presentation, let's say that they have a short haircut and yes. they're wearing, let's say they're wearing makeup or they have jewelry, right? So they're, they're presenting in both a way that is masculine and feminine. I only know their name and how they're choosing to present on this one day. I do not know their gender identity, so I do not know how I would communicate to my friend who I'm bringing our coffees to about this dope ass person that I just met. If I am not comfortable asking for this person's pronouns, then I would go to the conversation with my friend and say, yo, that barista Aaron was so cool. Like they even like drew these cool little things on our cup. I use they, them pronouns because I do not know what this person's pronouns are. And so I know it to be yeah. more respectful and safe to not assume someone's gender identity based on their gender, based on their gender expression or presentation. Yeah. But let's say I feel comfortable and I'm able to say, oh my gosh, Aaron, like, I love your haircut. Like, I was just wondering, like, what pronouns, like, should I use for you? And then I would explain, like, and if they're like, oh, I have no, oh, like, oh, like, I use, like, he, him, thanks so much for asking. Cool. Now I can be like, yo, Aaron, like, he drew these things on our cup, right? Like, I can confidently say he, him, because I was told he, him. I still don't necessarily know if Aaron identifies as a man or as non-binary, because there are plenty of binary people who use he, him pronouns, right? There's also non-binary people who use all pronouns or gender neutral and masculine pronouns. Mm -hmm. So I still don't know Aaron's gender identity. Now, what would commonly happen also is this, the fact that I will ask, I will say, hey, my name's Lex and I use they, them pronouns. And the person's going to be like, and then I say, so they, they normally know what I mean when I say like, my name's Lex, I use they, them. And I'd be like, what's your name and what's your pronouns? And they're like, my name's Aaron, but like, what do you mean by pronouns? Yeah. Totally fair, right? Like, no one asked me my pronouns my entire life until like, yeah. it came out of the street. People still don't ask me my pronouns. I have to insert my pronouns. I have to demand the conversation on yeah. pronouns. So yeah. when I get something like that, I say, oh, like, so for instance, for myself, I identify as non-binary. So if you were to say like, oh, I met Lex today, you would say they were so cool. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't say like he was so cool or she was so cool because I use they. So if I'm telling someone that I just met you, Aaron, would it be affirming for me to say, oh, I met Aaron and they are awesome or to be he is awesome or she is awesome. Like which language, like what is, what can I do to make sure that you are respected and affirmed? Would you say that for the majority of time, they, them would be the safest if someone feel like they don't want to invade someone's privacy and go, like from my experience, I work with, another person who identify as she, he, I mean, I'm sorry, she, her. And this person for the longest time did not disclose their gender identity because they don't feel comfortable at work. So when I actually have to be directly interacting with this person, I pull them aside and I just ask, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I see how you presenting yourself from the outside, but what is your pronouns? in private. So that was this conversation that I had. And this person said, yeah, she, her. So, but there are others, you know, ex experiences that I had that um, when we're in a group too, my friends trying to be very woke about it and they just assume and said, like, they, them would be the safest. I, so there is a lot I, of debate on this. Yeah. For and, sure. 
And I, I love what you're saying that like we can definitely make adjustment into our everyday life when we can just be like, "Hi, my name is my pronouns are." Um, but how is easier done on online on social media? You know, when you can actually write down on your email or whatever. But in like physical contacts, like how can we enforce this onto like an everyday thing? Yes. So two things I want to make sure that I say. So. In regards to uh, like what's the safest call pronoun wise, yeah. my belief is that it is always safest and most respectful to use they, them, or any form of gender neutral pronoun or, mm. or the person's name can literally be substituted for every single pronoun, right? Okay. So yeah. you can use gender neutral pronouns such as they, them, Zizir, M-A, like you can like use all of those, I may have pronounced those last ones wrong because I'm not as familiar with them, but there are gender neutral pronouns okay. out in the world. Okay. I, as a non-binary person, would feel a significant amount of pain and suffering if someone used a binary pronoun for me. I feel, if someone uses she, her, it's game over. Like somehow my depression like came back overnight, like just whipped me in the face and is like gonna take me um. down. But if someone uses he, him, I have made this narrative in my head that's like, oh, because our society has conflated masculine presentation with being a man, this person is actually affirming your masculinity. So do not take offense to someone using he, him. They are just seeing you as a masculine person. So I'm wow. like psychologically trying to like not feel pain every time I leave my house. Yes. Knowing that I would rather every single person use they, them pronouns for me. Mm. So because my experience is I have been caused so much pain and suffering because people wrongly use binary pronouns, my go-to is like, if you don't know someone's gender identity, don't put them through the pain and suffering you put me through, use gender neutral pronouns or use their name. However, I will say there are plenty of people who hate gender neutral pronouns for themselves. Big important, for themselves. For others, obviously is fine. And also if they didn't, if they were gonna say something about someone else's identity, they can just be erased because like, you are not gonna speak on anyone else's identity, but your own. But for themselves, they're like, I fought my whole life to be seen as this binary person. Like, why are you using non-binary pronouns for me? So people take offense sometimes to being referred to using gender neutral pronouns because of the constant invalidation of not being seen as the person that they are. Mm. So I think in my belief, it is always better to use gender neutral pronouns, gender neutral language, or just the person's name to not use binary pronouns, binary language. You will probably like at least like, you may come up against someone who's like, well, like I took offense to using these gender neutral pronouns. Take a deep breath, know that you did, your intent was to respect that person, tell that person, please let me know how I can better respect you. You don't have to be like, you don't have to get into the whole like, oh, I'm so ashamed and embarrassed of myself. Do not put that pressure and that conversation on someone else. But just like say like, oh, I'm so sorry. My intent was to respect you. And I didn't want to assume your pronouns or your identity. What language can I use for you? It's as easy as that. Use gender okay. neutral language, gender neutral pronouns. You can address if you need to correct yourself because we're humans and we make mistakes and we have to correct ourselves. Oh, that's great. I, I, I love that. <laughs> that was like mind blowing. Uh, <laughs> it, it's very easy. It's like just human be respectful. And yeah, um, yeah I, I, I love that. I love to hear that. And I have an experience um, where in the, in the beginning of my transition, you know how people always said, oh, worse the word. Like, they, they don't have anything unless you put something on it. So for me, in my transition, when I, before I grew, like, you know, breast tissue and stuff, I was comfortable with whatever else people want to use. You mm -hmm. know, I didn't wait. I didn't look like very them presenting. So when I go, people say, he, him, I was just like, whatever. Like, that's not the biggest deal. But when I grew breast tissue and when I put on bras and, you know, like, I present myself in a very certain way. When people misgender me, it, it really felt hard. You know, it, I was like, oh my gosh, like I've tried so hard, so much effort into looking the way I do. Someone who don't know me, met me for the first time, like assume. Like that's painful. So I, I do get it. And I feel like for people who identify with those feelings that we feel, it's easier that oh, we'll try hard enough. Like you have to do better. Yeah. Um, with my yesterday when it comes to race is that like always assume that you are racist so you can try to be better so would you agree that like when it comes to 
you know, our issues with like transphobia and all of that and using the right pronouns, all of it, always assume the worst of yourself. So then you can always try to do better. Would you, would you say that? I have never heard that perspective before, but I actually really like what it's doing psychologically. Because yeah. even like, especially with uh, the increase in race conversations, thank God, because all like racism has been here forever, but like people are finally paying attention, quick note. Yeah. But like on respect with that, like the number of times I have posted things to educate folks on like, whether it's like anti-black phrases or like the history of racism, whatever it may be, I will always without a doubt get at least three white people on my page saying, I've never been called a racist or I've never used these phrases. And I'm like, the, for so many different reasons, I'm like, this isn't about you. Yeah. Because you said those things, I think you actually really need to read this post again. And like, yeah. like just like this idea that if we, if we self-proclaim that we are advocates or we are allies or we are educated, then we're not going to have that internal drive to do the work, to stay educated, to be more informed and to have an actual understanding that is effective and not like surface level fake allyship. And yes. so in like a similar vein, I, I love this idea of maybe not like, <laughs> maybe not like saying like, oh, I am inherently like transphobic, but saying like, I inherently do not know nearly as much as I should about people who are trans or who are queer. And because of that, I need to make sure that I am staying educated. I am following queer content creators. I am supporting and uplifting the trans queer folk in my life, right? Like coming from this place of like, don't put yourself on a pedestal. We all literally, regardless of who we are, have so much more we can learn. I have more I can learn about trans identity and queerness. Like, I'm not gonna put myself on a pedestal and say like, oh, like I am the, like advocate I'm like no like I am learning too and so having that mindset of like okay like I learned this new thing I'll add it to my tool belt all right like what's next like we all need to be in this constant conversation and like please folks like get rid of these com like these comments like oh like I like I have black friends like like they haven't told me using this word is wrong why are oh you generalizing your experience that's with so your handful That's of black friends to everyone. Oh my God, I just like, I literally, oh my God. And now I'm sweating so much because I'm so heated. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I do think it's important to touch base with this. Yesterday I saw a story that you posted. I don't know what was the conversation before that, but then this person basically defending their racism by saying that like, I said this word around my black friends and they never said anything. Ooh. Oh, I unpacked the shit out of that. Oh my I god, was... yeah. that's make. <laughs> it's, uh, and honestly, it's like, I'm glad that the people that are thinking that are actually saying it because there are so many more people that are thinking that and not saying it that can then yeah. become a part of the conversation and then start to learn the ways in which their, their even initial understanding and perspective of racism or race or language or just like how what I say impacts someone else like needs to be changed. Yes. And so that was actually, that was a, I'm trying to remember, I think that that was a post about like anti-black phrases that have been just like casually thrown into our vernacular without us even being educated on their history. Yes. And so I got a lot of comments like, oh, but like my black friends like use those words or like I use it around like, and I'm, like I was like, firstly, generalizations about any identity that you are not. Like you cannot generalize like black experience especially as a white person and then the person was like well you're doing that and I said what I did was state a fact black people are marginalized black people are experiencing brutality these phrases have historically been used as weapons against black people I do not give a fuck if this language yeah. is harming you or yeah. if it just so happens to not be harming your black friends that's great why would I want black people to feel harmed when you're using language that is racist however Please never, ever again think that it is okay to generalize your experience wherever the heck you are in the world with the overall experience of Black people in America. So yeah. there's just like so much more in that. Feel free to check out my post to see my lengthy responses <laughs> to these people. But, but yes. Yeah, but at the end of the day, if a Black person tell you this is racist, shut the fuck up and learn. Yeah. If a <laughs> tell you this is transphobic, Shut the fuck up and learn. Yes. <gasps>
Period. I need, this is this needs to be my next ringtone. Just shut nope. the fuck up and learn. Like seriously, it's so easy. It really is. But fragility but people, is yeah. like a beast. Yeah. The fragility of people is like yeah. the thing that is really like preventing them from being okay with engaging because if you're wrong and you're fragile, then like you're not going to want to engage. You're going to want you're going to get defensive. You're going to bring up all of the things you probably shouldn't be bringing up. A whole other rant. But <laughs> But what they don't understand is that like a couple minutes of you feeling uncomfortable because this conversation is brought up. Imagine how that person been feeling, experiencing the whole life. Yeah. So yes. people need to be less self-centered and not give themselves the allyship, like reward so fast. Like you want to be rewarded for doing the minimum. There's so much more that we can do. Like no one's going to be perfect, but like try to be understanding. Yeah, uh, we we could go into that for hours, but go I, into it. <laughs> I do have a couple more questions that I, I want to ask you since you know. Yeah. Um. One question asked is, "What about gender fluid? What pronouns can I use?" So, if you, someone who is gender fluid, the answer is you can use any pronouns you want. You can use mm. all pronouns. You can use one set of pronouns. You can use gender neutral pronouns. Mm -hmm. As someone who is gender fluid, mm -hmm. as someone who, whether, or maybe as someone who's a trans man or someone who's a trans woman, you yeah. get to choose your pronouns. Just because, let's say, our society says that men use he, him pronouns, you can be a man who is comfortable using maybe she, her pronouns, maybe yeah. he, him, and they, them pronouns. The truth is, is that there isn't an answer to that question. The answer is, what do you feel comfortable with? As a gender okay. fluid person, like what is affirming to you? What feels safe and comfortable for you? Yeah, so it's more personal preference. Yes, in the same sense that like the myth that all non-binary people, or like to be non-binary, you have to be androgynous. Or if you're non-binary, yeah. you have to use they, them pronouns. Or to be non-binary, then you have to want to change your presentation or blah, blah, blah. Like, Literally, no. Like, I could have stayed with my long hair and my chest and not taking testosterone and still presented masculinely, still go by Lex, still use they, them pronouns, would have literally yeah. changed nothing, right? Like, non-binary people do not look a specific way. Trans yeah. women do not look a specific way. Cisgender yeah. men do not look a specific way in the same way that cisgender women do not look a specific way. Why would you try yes. and say that trans people have to look a specific way? Yeah. Oh, well said. Okay, <laughs> Next question. For trans people, some go through HRT, some don't. What about non-binary people? How does someone transition as a non-binary person? Is it like valid when they said that they are non-binary or there are steps that they have to go through? So there are absolutely no steps that a non-binary person has to go through in the same sense that a trans woman doesn't have to go through any particular steps or a trans man. Typically yeah. what we are thinking about when we say like the steps to transitioning is this focus yeah. on the medicalization of the body, which mm -hmm. is a myth that in order to be trans, you have to medicalize your body. That is absolutely not the case. Yeah. So for instance, a trans woman may never like, want to, yes. We have two minutes, so let's, let's get this. <laughs> oh my God, let's okay, we got this. Yes, yes, oh my God, wait. I just forgot the question because I got freaked out. <laughs> um, the person like when they, when they said that like they transitioned. Non-binary, yes. <laughs> So being non-binary, you do not have to medicalize your body. You do not have to socially transition or medically transition in the same sense that a trans woman does not need to have breasts or have any form of surgery or body modification, whether it's like a push-up bra or whatever. If you're a trans masculine person or trans man, you do not need a packer. You do not need a binder. You do not need to have the titty chop. You literally do not need to medicalize your body. You also do not need to cut your hair or use the mannerisms that are associated with the gender that people are telling you you should do. Those are all socialized things that we are told you do not need to fit into them. Additionally, legally, you do not have to legally change your name or your gender. Literally, you have to do what works for you. None of these things are there because you have to do that and there is one path to being trans. Those things are there because they are options for us to feel more affirmed and visible in our bodies, hearts, and souls. Okay, one thing I wanna say and I'm gonna give you the last word. LGBT people, we can be whatever we want. Everybody's journey is different. That's what makes us so beautiful. You don't have to look like a certain person. Don't try to be a better them, trying to be the best you. Okay. Yes. Let's... Yes. No, I'll end on that. Like, we are perfectly imperfect the way we are. And I want you to know that you are loved, you are valid, you are not alone, and we are here.
Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you so much. I think Thank you for so having me. Okay, everyone, it's going to be in my IGTV, this whole conversation. And hopefully we can do it again soon. Yes, yes please. Yes. Yes. Full send. Much and love. Counting out.